Hello, hello, this is the Mythical Dragon here. Welcome to the Dragon's Den. Pull up a seat and select a drink of your choice. I don't have a drink myself. That's fine. I can speak for a whole maybe hour without a drink. Maybe? We'll see. But yeah, if you want whatever you want, it's there virtually for you to enjoy. Now for today's topic, we're going to dive into something that's been pretty normalized during the pandemic. And that is talking about virtual meetings and how to conduct them. I've been a Toastmaster now for a year and a lot of my, actually not a lot of my experience, my entire experience with Toastmasters has been online and, and virtual meetings. And I want to talk about the actual meetings themselves, how they're conducted, the expectations on them, and then my thoughts on that because there are so many good things that we've done as a Toastmasters club in a group when conducting a virtual meeting. However, there are some things that I wish could be more accepted or done a little better. So we're going to dive into this topic today and I'm actually kind of excited for it because as I've been doing this for a year now with Toastmasters, I've had a lot of thoughts built week after week on the meetings themselves. And now that I'm the Vice President of Education, I'm in charge of the programming and the actual conducting of these meetings. So it's really, really important and I'm interested to hear what your guys' thoughts are on the meetings itself as well. Just whatever meetings you've been a part of for work, for teaching too. I know a lot of teachers have been teaching online and I can speak to that experience too because I do so every Friday night. And there's a lot to dive into, so we're going to begin. I do you like virtual meetings? I want to start and state that on the record. I do like meeting virtually. It's not the same, obviously, as being in person for that easier facial recognition and you have to stare into like a circle on your computer versus staring at the people in the rooms. So there's definitely a lot of not so good things about virtual meetings, but I do like them. I find for myself, at least, I can stay focused better. I know that each part of a meeting has a purpose to it, which really does help with engagement and with staying focused and wanting to know more and do more in a club format, in a work format, in a teaching format too. So not to say that those things that you would normally a part of don't have a purpose or don't serve the same thing in person. But I find it's very different virtually because if you are getting people to log on to something like Zoom or Microsoft Teams or Google Hang, or is Google Hangouts still a thing? I don't remember. Skype even, maybe, or Discord. You're going to want to give them a reason to do so because if there's no reason, if you're just logging in and go, hey, what's up, or just kind of check in very casually versus purposefully, a lot of people are going to be like, ugh, why did I come? Why did I attend this? Why am I here? So that's the thing I've noticed with the, at least with Toastmasters and my teaching classes too, is that there has to be a purpose. There has to be some sort of engagement. There has to be something there for people to want to come back and log in virtually to experience. If there's nothing there, if there's no substance, purpose, agenda, anything like that, you're going to get sick of them very quickly, very, very quickly. And for Toastmasters, we're very fortunate. We have a program every week that really breaks down meetings into parts, sections, and purposes, which I think that's what we do well as Toastmasters is that's what's done very well. The classes I teach online, I've taken the same setup, the same sort of break it down by part by part by section by section for my classes because that means it keeps the students engaged they know the direction we're going and they know what to expect and that helps so much with virtual meetings if you if the people come in for the first time as a guest or as a keynote speaker or someone new to the meeting the club the organization whatever it may be they're going to want to understand why this meeting's happening why they are there 
and the impact of their presence that is. But that's something to really keep in mind as well. So a few things there to break it down a bit more. Make sure your meetings have a purpose, that there is a set goal or achievement or accomplishment to have from the meetings. Then you want to organize the meetings so that there's some kind of structure. People need structure. Even if you're someone who can chaotically bounce through a meeting okay without the structure, you learn to appreciate the structure when it is there. So have some sort of structure. Break down your meetings into sections or parts like a Toastmaster meeting. So for that example, Toastmaster starts off with a gathering, greeting, chit-chat kind of beginning session before the meeting formally starts. Then there's the housekeeping items, the reminders, the introductions to you, so every member will introduce themselves and talk about the theme. Then it breaks down into like the prepared speeches portion, then there's like a break scheduled, then there's table topics, and then the evaluations afterwards. So there's set sections and they're organized by time. And with a little wiggle room, of course, because time is fluid <laughs> and it escapes all of us. But with each of those sections, there's a purpose to each one. Prepare speeches. We have members that worked on a project and now they're ready to present and deliver a speech based on that project. And we get to support them and listen to their hard work and efforts and support them through that process. Table topics. That is impromptu speaking where someone in the club volunteer to be the master, the table topics master, and we'll have questions prepared regarding to the theme, relating to the theme, and they will pick on people at random to answer the questions to work on that impromptu speaking skill. Very important for job interviews, that sort of thing. So there's a huge purpose to that. Same with the prepared speeches. And then evaluations, of course, that's giving feedback, learning what you did well so you can recognize your strengths, and then also recognizing the areas to improve on and keep working towards in Toastmasters. Every section of that meeting has a purpose. That's important. We've got the beginning, lead up to the meeting to build that rapport, that sense of community, friendship, relationships, networking, all that kind of stuff happens before the meeting. Then you dive in and the tone is set, the preparation is set, and each section is prepared and done with purpose, and that makes people want to come back more and more. So the organization is also very, very important to virtual meetings, and every member needs to understand that's the direction the meeting is taking place, and that's where it's headed. So we always have a Toastmaster for our meetings. Well, we're all Toastmasters, but basically like a host of the meeting, who part of their role is to explain these sections again, to keep reminding us why we are here, the purpose of each part, and what we can learn from it. So Toastmasters does that very, very well. At least from my clubs that I'm a part of, we do that quite well. I'm not sure how other clubs do it, of course, but otherwise it works quite well in this virtual setting to do it that way. And part of Vice President Education is I'm the one that makes sure that happens. I'm the one that prepares that program, makes sure the purpose is established when I'm planning it, and when I'm reaching out to members to take on roles, I need to know, they need to know the purpose of that role, the purpose of that section of the meeting that they're being a part of or taking part in. And it's a really big, important part of the virtual meeting. I'm the organizer of it. I also need to make sure every member is comfortable, prepared, and good to go for their role. And that helps create a successful meeting, is if everyone's ready, prepared, and has some sort of excitement or motivation to be there, then you've done a good job. You have ran that meeting well, and they're going to want to keep coming back, and they're going to want to keep signing on, even if it is a boring conference call that they have to be a part of. There will be something in that element that wants them to come back, that you want them to come back for. So the purpose, the organization, setting the time limits, and having a purpose is so, so important for virtual meetings. Now to flip this and kind of apply it to my teaching classes, so if you're a teacher online, it's not something super different from being in the classroom. You still have your objectives for each lesson that you would go over with your students. Maybe your review of the last lesson before or the unit before. Then you dive into your lecture, your instruction part of the meeting potentially, or of the class. 
then there's the activities and that's where the activity management is very hard to do as a teacher online. In a classroom, you can walk around the room, make sure the students are focused and they're working and they're not doing anything they're not supposed to. You can physically be there and walk around and see them. Virtually, you are at a computer screen, looking at their faces on the webcam, hoping that they are doing what they're supposed to be doing online, on the computer behind them or on in front of them. It's very tricky and I know some teachers have said that like they've had students not hand in anything all semester because they didn't do it. They'll admit it. Like I straight up didn't do it. So how do we do that? How do we find the engagement that we need for them to actually want to do the activities set by you as a teacher? It's all about that purpose and forming that connection with your students. You need to get to know your students somehow, some way. So maybe every lesson you'll do like an icebreaker activity where you get to have a laugh, you get to have some fun, show their creativity signs, get to know them better, do something, maybe not for the whole year, but maybe for that first month, do an icebreaker activity at the end, at the beginning of each lesson to get to know your students and how they think and how they formalize their thoughts. So that way when it comes to, you know, further down the road where the workload gets a little more heavier, things are a little more intense, they have to review for exams, study, all that big part of being a student, you'll know how they work, you'll know how their brain works, and you can really emphasize that for your purpose as to why we have to do lessons this way or why you have to teach what you have to teach. For example, you've got a student who loves history try to bring some historical elements into your lessons to keep them engaged and wanting to do the work. Provide that as an option for a book report or for, I have all English examples right now, guys. I'm very sorry. I am an English teacher, so this is where I'm coming from. But let's say you're working on a novel in class and there's a big current event or some sort of event that happens in the book you can have that as an option for a project that they can do or for an assignment. Research what that event was, who was involved, what, 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 how, what was the problem, and how was it resolved. A great way to keep that student who loves history engaged in your lessons and wanting to do something with the book you're reading. They may hate the book. Don't get me wrong, I've been in that situation. I still to this day do not like Catcher in the Rye. Sorry, people who like Catcher in the Rye do not like it. But if you've got a good teacher, they'll find a way to bring you into that book and find a way to at least to like it, even if it's for one chapter, one event, one paragraph even of the book. So that's what I recommend for online teaching is find a way to get to know your students, form your purposes around the things that will engage them, create options, flexibility, and make sure they know what each class is going to be about, the direction it's going, and if that direction steers away and gets distracted or you sort of go into random tangents about maybe the Great Depression for the whole class instead of doing the book review or book analysis, <laughs> that's fine. You've spent that class create, putting in meaning to that class to keep them engaged and excited. So even if it's style, if it goes off track a little bit, the students are going to recognize your passion, your interest in the subject, their interest in them, and that will help a lot. Now I talk about this in the English language arts setting, but I don't teach those classes right now currently. I teach D&D &D online, which is a whole different ballpark for conducting a virtual meeting and a virtual classroom. D&D &D is flexible. There are moments where things will shift, change. You'll have two students that will be the main part of the session, basically. And then the others get left behind. So you have to think about how to bring them in or ask them on their thoughts or how to get them involved so that those two, two, two students who are constantly being in the thick of it aren't always dictating the show. So there's so many uncontrollable moments with teaching D&D that I have to really come up with strategies to bring the class engaged, bring them into the meeting, make sure they feel a part of it some way, somehow. So how do I do that? How do you do that if you run your own D&D classes or D&D virtual sessions? You let it play out. So of course, if there's two characters having a conflict with each other, you've got to play it out. You have to have it happen. 
whatever is going on to have those two characters be the main focus or even one character be the main focus you do have to have that happen it's the way it works absolutely especially if you've set the plot or a story or surprise that involves a character then they are going to be the main focus absolutely because backgrounds and all that kind of jazz but you also want to make sure everyone else is engaged or else they, it's when they start picking up their phones, getting distracted, looking at memes online, BuzzFeed quizzes. I've been guilty of doing BuzzFeed quizzes during a D&D session before. <laughs> Sorry to all my past DMs that watch this episode. I have literally done BuzzFeed quizzes during some sessions. Hi. And it's not to say that I wasn't engaged. I was. I was listening. But I realized, oh, my character will not have any reason to jump in so I'm just gonna keep my mind busy because then I'll start feeling left out lonely blah 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 but we want to avoid that so how can we avoid that you can do this in a number of ways you can present the conflict happening work through that moment with the character and then if you see that things are getting intense or that there's maybe a moment for a break you can say we'll return back to you in a moment the rest of you you are standing here watching this happen what are your thoughts? How does your character react? Or what? how are they reacting? That can be a great way to bring each person in. And you can have that 30 seconds with each person in the room, in the virtual room, <laughs> to explore their character's thoughts. And it's a great teaching moment for me. Because as young kids, they it's really hard for them to understand that it's not how they feel, but it's how the character they've created feels. And so that's where I do my teaching the most, is to say, okay, we've seen, I'm gonna, what's a random name for one of my campaigns? Oh, Halloween. Why not? We'll make the character Halloween. Halloween had a moment with its god, with his god, and betrayed the god in one of my sessions as a class. And so there's a lot of crazy conflict happening, and through the anger of the god, I'm like, I can't remember the god's name right now, guys, I'm not gonna lie, but... Uh, instead of him having this private conversation with Halloween, it ended up starting out privately, you know, within the mind and in like a safe kind of like prayer room situation. But then the members went to go get him because they have to keep traveling, keep moving on to solve the quest and that kind of thing. It's a campaign, of course. That's when the quiet connection became a physical. Suddenly, the god was in the room ready to punish this character because he really really messed up uh, in terms of like the god's beliefs and being a disciple of this god really big mess up happened i paused before anything could get you know <laughs> violence between the god and the player and the character and i went to the rest of the team you see this happening straight up i'm not gonna make you roll for it there's no inside checks needed no wisdom saving throws it's now very apparent that you see the thunder crackling in the room where there's no windows. You see a storm brewing and a face in the clouds and it's getting louder and louder and louder. And you see Halloween, the character, getting scared, scared, and scared. Is there anything that your character wants to do? Would your character step in? And then that's when I get to do the teaching moments going, okay, so for example, this character, you are a dragonborn, you've got really no magic, she's a barbarian, dragonborn barbarian character, you have very little magic influence on you, but you see someone in danger, is that something your character would want to protect, jump in, and do something about, or do they believe in, you know, they may, they messed up, they deserve the punishment, kind of asking those questions to get them thinking about how their character would behave versus how they would behave and it leads to some really great moments to how okay, I might as well resolve that for you all here <laughs> basically the barbarian in the party the paladin and I think the one sorcerer actually jumped in the paladin threw up his shield in front of the character Halloween and spoke to, you know, justice, because he was a paladin of justice, that was his oath, it was for justice, basically, not really related to God or anything like that, but this God was about justice. So he tried to do persuasion roles, basically, to convince 
I'm gonna just talk over the sirens, guys. At this point, I don't care. <laughs> uh, I just there's so much going on downtown lately that I just have to push through. But the paladin tried to persuade him, going, "Look, I understand the reason for punishment, and punish him by all means. He deserves to be punished. But don't outright kill him. Killing doesn't solve the problem. Killing doesn't make lessons be learned." Stop doing that and try to roll persuasion checks. The barbarian went into a rage and decided to basically it's like a prayer room set up. So there's like this little like altar to this god. Like the character, the player made this altar like from the materials out of his bag and kind of did this praying, asking for forgiveness. Kind of a scene there. When the persuasion rolls weren't working and the sorcerer tried to jump in and help so that advantage rolls and it wasn't quite enough still despite all that they were trying to do. The barbarian dragonborn looked up into this cloud, the stormy clouds that at this point was actually hardcore raining in this room. Looked up at him and basically said, you're not listening to us and I prevent you from doing this to my friend. You were connected here to this physical tether. How did I destroy this? And basically just took her great great hammer. She had a hammer. We made it a great hammer, because why not? Great axe exists, great sword exists, great hammer. Took her great hammer and smashed through the altar, ending the connection. It was such a cool way to see like those characters get involved and really having the players go, oh, my character would not like that. She would want to get rid of it. I'm like, okay, we'll roll an insight track to see if you know how to get rid of it or get rid of this god from the room. So it's really, really interesting. But that's how you can keep your players, your students, your people in a virtual meeting engaged. Pause what might be happening. Be like, okay, we've explored this issue quite a bit. We've seen all sides of it from every angle. There are many other people in this room that have to assist with it as this assist with this decision or react to it so we're going to pause here because things have reached its point let's go around the room and figure out which direction we're headed or which reaction we're going to go with or something along those lines because it's all great and fun to let one person dictate and control a story or control a meeting or control something for a long period of time in a ritual setting but it's not fun for anyone else and so we really need to work on that engagement and make sure that people feel seen, that they have a voice and can be heard. So that's how I recommend keeping that engagement, and especially with D&D &D, uh, virtually and Roll20 and all those other means that we have to play D&D &D nowadays. Gotta keep that engagement the best you can. I mean, sure, if you have a three hour session, yeah! Let that character have a 20 minute moment and have your other players excuse themselves and take a break or whatever for sure. But if you have an hour and a half session like I do for my classes, that's not a lot of time to have one character dictate a whole part of the class and the session. So I try to do those techniques quite a bit going, okay, you all see this happening. Uh, we're going to pause there before we find out the results because you all have the option to step in and get involved or not. What would you like to do? So there's many different ways to keep virtual meetings engaging. So I guess the summary up to this point here is make sure that you've got a purpose for your meeting, that the objectives are set, that everyone knows what's happening from start to finish in the meeting, and that you need to know why does it matter to them? Why are they here? Why are they going through this? Why are they waking up at 8 a.m. to go on a Zoom call? They need to know why and why it's important. Second thing is, have each part of the meeting relatively planned out with a purpose for each part. So there's the overall purpose, the overall, this is why I'm getting up at 8 a.m. to do a Zoom meeting. The overall purpose, then each part that you have in the meeting or each section of the agenda that you've created needs to have a purpose as well and a clear, definitive time allocated to these purposes. That's one thing I've struggled with the committee meeting that I'm a part of our Toastmasters is we are very excited people. We've got tons of ideas, but we constantly run out of time. So that's something we work on is trying to actually schedule. Okay, we're going to only do 20 minutes on this topic, 20 minutes on this task, and then we're moving on to the next task. 
because each part that we have for a committee meeting, we have tried to have three equal parts of three equal businesses of importance. And so that's something that we've been working on too. And then with Toastmasters meetings, I explained those like portions of the meeting and why they're important and why we're doing it and why we're all present for each part. So that's something that you want to learn as well. Time management, purpose for each part, section, and purpose for the overall meeting. And then you want to have engagement. So whether you're a teacher teaching regular high school classes and you've got 30 kids on your screen, you may not want all 30 kids talking at the same time. By all means, that's a little crazy, chaotic, and you feel like you have a million voices in your head. I've been there. But you want to make sure that you can tell that they are engaged and they are enjoying some aspect of what you're teaching, even if it's not their favorite book or their favorite character or their favorite poem or their favorite unit. Find a way to keep them engaged, and that's through messaging them directly in the chat, maybe, or sending them an email afterwards, or even just asking students, hey, I know we're on a break right now, and I don't mean to take up too much time for you, but can I have these students, blah, 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 stay for just two minutes so I can check in. You want to make sure that the students know that you know, and that you see them, and that you want them to be heard and understood and make sure they understand too. For d and and other meetings, you want to find a way to bring everyone into the meeting, even if it's just for 30 seconds to state an opinion that they have. Find a way to bring them in because as soon as you start excluding people or they feel like they've just sat there in an hour and a half meeting with nothing to say and nothing to do, you're going to lose them. You're going to lose them very quickly and then the resentment builds and then that's where we get zoom fatigue and uh, so many other like negative impacts from that you want to bring them in make sure they feel engaged and feel that they're characters for lack of word <laughs> lack of better context uh, feel important that's a really good way to conduct a virtual meeting i know there's not always time in a virtual meeting to do that that do that but if even if you've got like a feedback form that they can fill out while someone's presenting or speaking, or if you can just check in with them in the chat, asking if they want to speak to something that happened. You gotta find a way to keep that engagement because, man, it's I've been to meetings before where I've done nothing and have said nothing, and I feel at the end of those meetings I'm like, why was I there? Why did I come? Why? What was my purpose of coming? I wanted to see this, and how come I didn't see it? So that's just something to keep in mind for virtual meetings and how to conduct them. Now let's talk about Zoom fatigue. This is something very, very big and that's been like a really buzzy, buzzwordy word. <laughs> wow. Um, I can't remember what I'm trying to say here, but basically we've seen Zoom fatigue everywhere. Now you could do every single thing right. Every week you have those meetings, they feel great, you've conducted them, they feel empowered, they learned a lot, but you're still gonna get Zoom fatigue. And how do we combat that in a world where everything has to be virtual or mostly virtual still? I know some parts of the world are quite open still and if you're vaccinated or if you wear a mask and you have a negative test result, then you can go and be more in person. Very cool, all the power to you. That's very fair as long as you do it right and safe but we're we're still in a world that's predominantly virtual and zoom fatigue is huge a lot of us have realized that we're getting vision issues by staring at the screen for long hours and long periods of times and so now we've got to look into um, the reflective glasses or blue light glasses or even changing the settings on your computer to play around with the blue light that can affect your vision, headaches, even like just the exhaustion that you feel. There's so many things that you can do to combat that, like with your settings, like my computer right now, you can change it to night mode and that changes the blue lighting. So that's why the light on your screen isn't so bright and jarring in the middle of the night. If it turns on for some reason, because my laptop likes to do that, you can change it to that night mode and you can actually put that night mode on your computer during the day. So if you know you're going to be on a computer or a conference call like for three hours at a time, twice a day or three times a day or even one three hour meeting is enough to cause a headache sometimes, 
you might want to play around with that. Play around with that setting so you don't feel that actual physical ugh for a meeting. There's other things to do as well where now this is where controversy comes in because Toastmasters, we want everyone to be on webcam throughout the whole meeting to make sure that we see that they're engaged, they're learning, and they're taking part. Maybe that's not good for you. Maybe you need to just ask the host or whoever's conducting the meeting if it's okay to have no camera on today. Find whatever works for you because like I'm not gonna lie, there's been some Toastmasters meetings recently where I would work 11.30 to 8 a.m., come into the meeting at 1 p.m., barely any sleep because I get home around 9 a.m., barely any sleep, I feel like crap, I haven't showered, <laughs> I'm like in pajamas still, and I don't want to be on camera for Toastmasters, but that's the expectation. So on one hand, it's nice because then I know that I have to brush my hair, kind of put on a nice top, and kind of look put together, and that helps with mental health and confidence a bit. But on the other hand, it feels like you're forcing yourself to do something you don't want to do that day. And that's where Zoom fatigue can come in as well. I've been feeling it quite a bit lately where I wish I could just be in Toastmasters meeting, have my camera off, and just be there. I'm still learning. I'm still being engaging. I'm still going to be messaging in chats, unmuting to give feedback, comments, fulfilling my roles. Why do I have to be on camera? And that's going to be a part of this podcast here in a little bit, but maybe ask if you can keep your camera off for that meeting, for that class, for that lesson, and let make sure to ask permission. Don't just do it because you're like, I don't want to be on camera. Blech. <laughs> like you want to ask permission, make sure it's okay, and that you can just explain a little bit too. Like I'm having a rough day. It's all right if I just turn off my camera, even for like the first 20 minutes, just to kind of mentally recalibrate and make sure I'm present for the meeting. I really recommend it. I really, really do. And that's something I'm going to talk to my executive about for Toastmasters because the expectation to be on camera all the time is so daunting for so many people and it's so exhausting for those of us that are just worn out and burnt out from other things happening in the pandemic. And having that one meeting where you can just relax, not worry about what you look like or how you're reacting to things, it can help a little bit. I don't recommend it doing every meeting. It is nice to kind of go on and show your smiling face and show how happy and excited you are to be there. But every now and then, it's I think it's okay. I think you're allowed to take that break. Turn off that camera. Relax. Keep engaged, keep interacting in other ways that you can, chat function, private messaging, unmuting or putting on Zoom slides because they have like little reactions so you could like raise a hand or you could do like the little clapping <laughs> emoji, that's my favorite one to do. You know, there's still ways to keep engaged and keep engaged and so the expectation and bullshit really of keeping your face on camera the entire meeting needs to go away to help combat Zoom fatigue as well. Another thing that I've learned that helps with Zoom fatigue a bit is, I know this is really anxiety inducing, so I'm very sorry for all of us socially awkward people and socially awkward beings, but pick up the phone and call someone so you're not on the screen. Have a normal phone call because that helps you. You're not being on the screen, you're not being on your laptop, you can be mobile, you can go outside and like be in nature and be away from that screen that helps too because it's still connecting with another human you are reviewing my, what have happened in the meeting you're getting outside you're escaping the four walls of your bedroom just do something like that get outside call someone on the phone don't have to be on the screen to have every interaction it helps so much and I love putting on my headphones and having a call like on my phone because I can put my phone in my pocket and I've got my headphones on. I know I've got a mic near my mouth and I can still engage while doing other things away from the computer and it helps so, so much. As the vice president of education for two clubs, being a member of a third club, 
being a club coach, having regular meetings with the executive, one-on-ones with the other club coach, Austin, who I will talk about forever in these podcasts. There's so much screen time, and plus I'm doing these YouTube videos three times a week. I am also meeting with other members of the club to make sure they're okay and that the progress that they're making is what they've expected and that they're learning a lot or if they need help. I am on the computer constantly. And the fa- there's more than just Zoom fatigue. There is laptop fatigue. There is being connected virtually in many different senses, ways, and forms exhaustion. And I get that every week. And it's just so hard to, and I wish my city, I wish my province and city was a little better with what's going on in the world right now, because I would totally meet up for coffee with some of these people in person just to get that break (laughs) from the virtual setting. But it's just really not a possibility right now for my part of the world. I'm not going to get into that. That's a whole rant about COVID that mm, none of you really need to hear right now because I'll probably cry. So we're going to avoid that. But you got to find a way to combat it. Uh, Maybe you'll do a Zoom meeting outside. Uh, It might be awkward to take your laptop outside to a park bench and do one per se, but on mobile, you can download the Zoom app, Skype app, Microsoft Teams, whatever thing you have to use for (laughs) your virtual meetings. But go outside and have that meeting. Just say that you're going to be off camera because you're outside and You'll keep muted, but if you have anything to say, you'll let them know and you can unmute and talk about it. But just kind of find a way to get away from the desk, get away from the four walls, and get away from that glaring screen. Because I tell you, there are how many hours a week am I on the computer? Oh, way too much. Oh god, I think I'm on the computer more than I work in a week. Yeah, because I work 32 hours a week, and I think with all the projects I'm doing, oh, maybe it's about the same. So for Toastmasters meetings only, I'm on the computer for two and a half hours for that. Then it's another usually hour and a half, two hours with Austin. So that's already quite a bit of time there. That's like, what, four and a half hours of meetings there. Then I've recorded three episodes a week that are about an hour each, so that's another three hours there. It's about almost 10 hours of computer straight up with work, with like meetings alone and recording. Then I'm on the laptop for one-on-one meetings, usually with other members, at least once or twice a week. That can be up to two hours, three hours long. Throw that on there, that's about 13 hours right there. Then I'm working on all my projects. So I'm writing speeches, I'm creating the agenda, I'm working on, currently I'm developing a six month plan for my one club because I'm a club coach for that club and I have to create what the next six months are going to look like, what events we're going to be hosting, what are going to be our next moments of membership drive, and future considerations like the timing of the meeting and all that jazz. So that takes a lot of work. I'm also creating all the social media content for both clubs, for Northern Lights and Core Development. That, all of that on itself is probably at least a couple hours a day. So seven days a week, that's another 14 hours being on the computer. So yeah, I'm basically on my laptop in like a full-time capacity, if you think about the work week. On top of what I do for work and busing and other commitments and teaching and- Oh, and teaching? I teach for- (laughs) You get the point. The computer exhaustion is real and anytime I get a moment where I can just sit outside get away from it all, even leave my laptop or leave my phone in the room, I will go do it. Even if that means I'm just going to sit on the balcony outside in the middle of the night for just a couple hours or for 30 minutes, a fresh air, the break from a bright screen, it just helps so, so much. I can't utter how important that has been for me because you've heard it. I'm on the screen constantly. And it's bad because like when I have really bad mental health days, instead of going outside and being healthy and exercising and doing all that shit like you're supposed to, I binge watch (laughs) things. Uh, So I need to learn to maybe less binging, more nature, more outside, more fresh air and energy and healthy food and such like that. So 
you gotta find what works for you. Maybe binging stuff will help, but maybe you put that on the TV instead of your computer, where your computer is more closer to your face. Put that on the TV and just lay back on the couch and relax. Or bring your laptop out to the balcony and watch something outside. So you still have that fresh air, that kind of reinvigorating sense of yourself. I'm really struggling with words today, but you get what I mean. So that's another way to combat fatigue. Also, find someone you can just have a conversation with off the screen. I, I'm fortunate because I live with my sister, so we can go out in the living room and just chat, chat, chat away, and I can have that break, that much-needed break from my screen sometimes. Maybe if you know, well, it's up to your stance on COVID and vaccines and such, but if you know a friend of yours that is fully vaccinated and you're, you've got, oh, in my area, you need to have a proof of vaccine to enter some places, so... If you know both of you have that and you want to go and have a coffee, do it. Because you're fully vaccinated, you can still wear a mask and be safe. Uh, that's my stance on it, so I'm sorry if that's not your stance on it, but that's what it takes for me to be comfortable with going for coffee with someone. Or maybe even just read a book. <laughs> that sounds like a really teacher advice for you guys right there, but just reading a physical book. And getting away from the screen can help too. Because, yeah, being on a camera constantly, or being on the computer constantly, being on social media constantly, binging Netflix constantly, really, really affects your mental health. It really does. And for me, some days it's a lot, and I can't look at my phone anymore. I don't go on my laptop. I'll go play Animal Crossing, which I realize is still a screen thing, but it's a nice way to disconnect. <laughs> And keep the screen, it gives a smaller screen, so less glare, less effect really on me. And I just take a break. And it helps a lot. Not always fully, because I'm someone who will push through it anyway and be like, I've got a to-do list and I need to go cross things off on that to-do list. So I feel like crap and I feel like I'm going to cry or I'm going to like scream or I'm going to throw something. But instead of doing any of those emotions or letting any of that out, I'm just going to go work on it anyway and just do my best to fight it through work. I don't recommend doing that because it leads to moments in a week where you're like, ah, and you fall apart. So there's ways to combat it. I'm still working on it myself. I'm not perfect. But at least I know I can set a system when I want to to make sure I'm okay. That's all I gotta say there. Because, yeah, I'm planning ritual meetings constantly. I am conducting them constantly. Providing feedback on them constantly. Ensuring engagement. Ensuring members feel supported. That the people in the virtual meeting feel supported, heard, listened to. There's so much focus on that, but that's why I figured I could do a podcast episode on it because I'm doing this week in, week out, at least three times a week, sometimes if not more. And it's just so important to do all these things and really check in with people because we've been isolated for so long that it's easier to isolate at this moment, which is a very scary thought. It's almost easier to isolate than to finally admit what's going on. I highly recommend to try to find ways to escape that habit. Isolation does not mean you have to be alone. Isolation just means you're being safe. So find the people you can connect with and find a purpose too. That's another good reason too. That's why conducting virtual meetings and doing Toastmasters is a purpose for me. I get so much out of it. So. If you should have that in your virtual meetings with whatever you're doing, whether it's taking classes online, teaching them online, doing a game night with friends, whatever you're doing for a virtual meeting, virtual setting, find some purpose with it, make sure it's known, and find a way to really enjoy it because you deserve it. We all deserve that. We deserve the moments of joy in a pandemic. We do. We are not supposed to be this sad, anxious, frustrated 24-7. Life is not about that. 
And I think that's my really big end point advice for conducting virtual meetings. Find the purpose for it, get to know who's in your meeting, get to know what they want out of the meeting, and plan it for them as well as yourself. Because if you do both, you're going to form those connections better, you're going to be able to network better, connect better, and your friendships will most likely improve too. Or your working relationships may improve as well. Yeah. I thought I was going to have a lot more to say on that. Oh, I do. Haha. <laughs> Why I don't like virtual meetings is the fact what I already talked about before. There is an expectation for every virtual meeting you are a part of to be on camera throughout the whole meeting, unless you need to go get a water, take a bathroom break, or you've got a phone call or there's some kind of background noise. Those are the only moments you're allowed to turn off your camera. I say, part of my French here, fuck that. If you're having a crappy day or something in that meeting bothers you, you should be allowed to turn off your camera because I've been in a situation where I was in a meeting and the feedback I received or some kind of comment really dug deep and it bugged me so much that I want, I started to cry. And so I would turn off my camera. And then I'd get like a little comment check going, Violet, are you back? Like, we want to know if you're here or not. And I'm like, I'm here. I just need my camera off for a moment. So it's just ridiculous that we have that expectation on students, on teachers, on Toastmasters members, on people in general in a virtual meeting to turn on their goddamn camera. No. If you're not feeling up for it, if you know it's going to bother you, if you know you can't handle it, you should be able to ask whoever is leading or conducting the meeting if you can keep your camera off for today. You should be allowed to do that and they should be able to tell you yes or at least tell you maybe for the first 30 minutes you can but then I'm going to need you to come back and be engaged physically, you know, f in quotations physically, in a 30 minutes. Is that okay? Like you just, it should be it should be a thing. You should be able to keep your camera off if you need to, need to, and longer than a couple minutes or five minutes for a break. If you are having a really crappy day, you should be allowed to keep your camera off. That's the one complaint about how I have about Toastmasters meetings, because the really unspoken rule is that I have to have my camera on. And nah, I don't think so. And that's something I want to bring up to uh, the members, or my executive at least, who is that I think it should be up to the Toastmasters discretion, so whoever is the host of that meeting, it should be up to their discretion if they will allow the camera to be off or on, instead of it being like a silently spoken thing that, yes, everyone has to have a camera on. Because it's just unrealistic. If you're not feeling well, or if you were... It's so hard to say this. If you're not feeling well, if you're having a mental bad, mental day, or a really crappy time, people will take time off from work for that. You know, some people will say, like, I can't come in, I'm not feeling great, and then no one usually complains. People don't complain about that. They're like, oh, I hope you feel better, and I hope things get better. That's the response. We should have that same response for virtual meetings. Absolutely. Now, it's a different situation if you are scheduled to speak or present or do something big in the meetings. That's a whole different story. That's kind of unfortunately where you have to muster through and be like, okay, I'm having a shitty day, but I agreed to do this. I can't cancel on it because I won't be able to come back for this meeting. Like if you're a keynote speaker or a guest speaker, I can't come back to this meeting for like another month. So they need me to do this. Okay, I got this. You're gonna have to do that little self-talk, that pep talk. And if you're there to observe, listen, learn, or you're just a regular attendee of a virtual meeting, you should be able to ask that permission to turn off your camera. It's so unrealistic and just so unrealistic for other things. Because yeah, if you're not feeling good and you get to stay home and no one needs to see you, <laughs> you know? So if you feel the same way in a virtual meeting, then yeah, don't force yourself to be seen. 
That's just my two cents on that because I've seen so many moments in other meetings where people were physically uncomfortable and they were forced to be, show their discomfort because they wouldn't, they felt like they couldn't turn off the camera and that's not okay. It really isn't. So yeah, I had an experience recently where uh, for some reason the one Toastmasters meeting I went to, just as a guest because I was going to ask for some help for one of my clubs, the table topics question I got was very like opinionated and it was kind of scary because it was about COVID, right? And vaccinations. And I was like, I don't want to answer this question because how do I answer this? Because she's expecting a yes or no answer to this and I don't want to say yes or no. <laughs> And so it was just such an uncomfortable situation. And my discomfort showed because I was like, I'm not going to hide this. I'm like, I, I don't know how to answer this. Um, and like, I gave like one of the worst table topic responses I could have in my life because I was all over the place. I was umming and awing. I was just like really scared to say anything wrong because it was presented in a way that there would be a wrong answer. So I was able to show that discomfort and sometimes that's good. You need to show that discomfort because that was a really bad question to ask to a group of people and someone you don't know. If you don't know the person, you shouldn't be asking them, is it unconstitutional? What was it? If you, oh, if you choose not to be vaccinated, are you unconstitutional? That was the question. And I was like, <laughs> what? And so I was physically discomforted. And I chose, instead of turning off the camera after Toastfest or after that table topic session, I kept it on. And that did lead for people wanting feedback. So sometimes it's good. I'll admit that. But in other moments, nah. Nah. I think if I ever had, was faced with something like that in a meeting again, I'd leave. Or just turn off my camera and say, I refuse to answer this question. Because that's just not okay to be forced into an uncomfortable situation and having to force yourself to keep your camera on through it. That's a little soapbox opera there, a little bit. <laughs> My apologies, everyone, but that's just the one thing I don't like about virtual meetings is the expectation you have to stay on camera the entire time, no ifs, ands, or buts. I allow my students to keep the camera off if they don't want to be on camera because I get it. They're in school, in their regular school, all day long. They are still in the middle of a pandemic. There's still so many anxieties, scary things, unknowns, that if I force them to put on a brave face through it all, when they're not feeling very brave, no, that's not okay. We wouldn't expect that from anyone. So that's the downfall of virtual meetings. But that was a really long episode, actually. I'm really glad I remembered to bring that up because I, that's what I think. Let me know what you think below. Do you think cameras should be on throughout a whole meeting or is there a time and place where you can keep that camera off and that's okay? Let me know. But that's how I've conducted virtual meetings throughout the pandemic is just making sure everything I do has a purpose. Everything I am participating in, running, organizing, doing has a purpose and then I try to keep the engagement within everything I do, making sure everyone has a chance to speak or say something or participate in something or has a way to feel seen, heard, and understood. That's very important to me and I've been working really, really hard on that throughout this last year and this crazy pandemic with a lot of Zoom fatigue, a lot of exhaustion, but it's a really great way to run a virtual meeting. Even for a boring conference call that you have to listen to like presentations and facts, you still want to find a way to make sure someone that's there has a purpose to be there. That's very, very important. So that all aspects of the meeting are understood. You have a clear direction of where you want to go over the meeting. And that way people can stay engaged, follow through very easily. As well as, yeah, keep that engagement somehow, some way, some form. Is what I recommend if you need to conduct a virtual meeting, even for a fun event, like hanging out with your friends for movie night or something more serious like a business meeting or a Toastmasters meeting, that advice will still carry through no matter what. So I really hope that helps if you have to conduct ritual meetings yourself. And it definitely helped me to remember my remember why I'm doing it myself, why I'm conducting ritual meetings and what I need to do for them. So it helped me to get this all off my chest. 
I hope you learned something from it, and thank you all so much for listening. Hope you enjoyed your drinks and the interesting podcast that I just gave. Uh, let me know what you thought, like it if you did, and tell your friends about the Dragon's Den, because it's a great place to come listen and hear a dragon ramble about life, and maybe learn something from it, who knows. <laughs> With that, take care everyone. Have a lovely time zone, uh, day, night, morning, wherever you are, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.